Okay, great. So I took Antonio's prompt to heart and I'm gonna spend you know, half the time talking about not things that we've done and are doing, but things that we aren't doing and that are hard um, that, that would be interesting for, for research. But to, to start out, I, I think basically, I assume most people know about Skydio um, in this group, but uh, we're, a, we're a company based out of Redwood City, California, and we make drones around autonomy. So our, our products are built around autonomous flight to be safe and trustworthy and intelligent. And we think that'll allow them to kind of scale to a broad range of use cases. Um, for example, cinematography, inspection and mapping and situational awareness. So that's our focus. And we've been working on this for, you know, I, I've been working on it for about six and a half years. The company has been around about a year longer than that. And, and we focused a lot on- May I quickly interrupt you? Yes. And there is a strange gray box in your um, presentation. And I am not sure whether this is a graphics driver issue exactly there, or are you able to move that box? I think away? these are the zoom uh, control bars, right? So maybe it's- That right. could be the case. But the problem is that we see them overlaid on the slides. I see. Um... I'll try to screen stop the share and try again. Mm, they're still there, but I think like if they're just like that, then they're not so disturbing. Before they were like much bigger and in the front of the image. I think that's fine if you continue like that. Okay, well, it's unfortunate. I'm not sure what, what's going on. Um, all right, so you know, so we've 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 focused for years on building up a robust vision-based autonomy system. I think we've had a lot of progress there. Um, you know, some highlights are that that we've we've done an, a super robust visual inertial odometry system based on the the rolling shutter cameras on our drones. These super wide fisheye two hundred degree cameras that that kind of have this trinocular up top and bottom configuration that that see in three hundred and sixty. Um, you can kind of see that on the bottom right here with the, 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 the cameras being stitched together where the yellow borders are the user camera field of view. Um, and then we, we believe we were the first to uh, have basically a deep learning based obstacle avoidance system in production. Um, and the, you know, we invested a lot of research into this and I think it's it's paid off greatly in, in terms of the, the gains we've seen from our first drone to our second drone um, from just the ability to learn from data and deal with imagery that is not photometrically consistent has been a huge win for us. Um, and then, yeah, investing in a unified planning and control system where there's, there's an optimization problem that considers a lot of things together, like the full state of the vehicle, not making assumptions about um, the dynamics and optimizing everything from kind of the rotor rates to obstacles to high level objectives together in the same system, which compared to, you know, a system with uh, cascaded kind of um, controllers often can, can better performance of, of reducing kind of assumptions and considering everything together and get, get closer to using the hardware to its full potential. Um, and then, of course, we've worked on a lot of autonomous workflows of, of actually applications of this, these robots. What are they for? And really focused on tight kind of vertical integration to make these things easy to fly, safe and trustworthy. Um, so things like, you know, in the top right here, you see us flying under, under a bridge in this very tight space where you're, you're not going to have GPS. You're not going to have um, a magnetometer. It's very tight conditions. The metal is somewhat reflective. So it, it's, it's relying on a lot of robustness in state estimation, obstacle avoidance, and, and everything to operate. And then the middle image here is kind of showing some difficult scenarios for obstacle avoidance and, and some of what our deep networks predict. So, you know, the slide that I would show here is this is kind of at the heart of what, what makes it hard to do visual navigation is just you have so many different scenes where you know, drones are machines that just get flown anywhere by, you know, by our customers. And it's, 
just a, a wide array of what what can be hard from you know, the sun glare here to thin objects to reflective things to moving things to things on the lenses different lighting conditions um so the this kind of span of you know the, the full domain of what you see in in production is just a lot of different things and that's kind of i think the heart of the challenge of bringing these things from um, prototypes to something that not just can be used by kind of pioneers in companies but actually can be used very broadly at at scale in different scenarios so that's that's a lot of what we focus on and this is a just a fun video that i like to show to highlight this which is it, it doesn't take much to be an extreme visual scenario um where here there's just two people we found this video on instagram um where they're they're kind of just writing skateboards down a street and uh, for the drone, you know, we've got this extreme sun, and then we've got all these power lines in front. And so, the you know, I consider this pretty pretty extreme scenario because you've got all these thin objects and a, a backlight. But the, the the people who are you know the drone is following them don't don't know this, and it certainly doesn't seem extreme to them. Um, so I think we're you know likely getting lucky here and and very well could have crashed but we're also doing a decently good job of seeing most of them and, and avoiding them so it's just highlighting how easy it is to find very difficult scenarios okay so one of the the goals of this workshop is to talk about dynamic objects so i just wanted to talk about some of the the challenges there that we might see um i think th there's some different examples here i've, I've highlighted so in terms of state estimation, I would say typically water is the biggest challenge because um, for, for us with 360 context, we can see all of the scene around us. So with good outlier rejection, with good tight coupling to the IMU, um, you can get away with a lot of moving objects around you and still be able to kind of latch on and, and use the right features. Um, but if you're in a difficult scenario, like uh, probably one of the hardest ones is being low under a low bridge over water um, because there most of what's around you is moving water and you also don't have gps which is typically what you want to you know rely on when you're flying over water and so you have to you have to know that you can't trust the water and you have to use you know the bridge the other structure around you and that's all you really have to work with so that's a that's a pretty key challenge with with you know, dynamic objects for state estimation. And then I think a, a lot of the other challenges around obstacle avoidance. So, you know, a lot of traditional map representations assume you have static objects. Um, now, stereo vision can help with, you know, see static objects. Um, if you're doing temporal estimation of, of the scene, then of course, moving objects will confuse you and you have to really think about scene flow. And in my mind, there's this kind of dichotomy of what objects are you specifically detecting, tracking over time as, you know, as, as objects? And what are you, is there some approach where you can get generic kind of motion in your map representation without having to kind of detect objects? And, and I think there's a, there's a lot to think about here. Um, but generally, you know, our, our drones can handle moving objects um, in in a lot of cases, if they're if they're objects that you know we're we're tracking around them, we we look at multiple objects and think about that. But there are um, many cases where you know if you if you toss a ball at our drone, there's there's no way it's going to see and avoid that. I think we're going to need um, to pull in a lot of the the research that we just saw in the the previous talk to be able to do that. Um, and then I think there's interesting challenges around if you have a dy dynamic scene, let's say flying with multiple people, how do you um, how do you decide to film them? And so this is kind of an example here of, you know, maybe I pulled this from, from YouTube of tracking and filming a, a biker here. And, and you've got to be able to know that the drone, you know, it's, it's got to track. If there's a biker below you, you've got to know about that and, and not hit them. And of course, that's a, that's a big safety concern. And then also, you know, here we're tracking the front person, but there's, there's interesting questions around if there's a group of people now, where do you position the drone? What's the best way to film footage of them? Um, and you know, the, the, the boat case here is, is tough because everything's moving. Um, and you, you, know, you, you have to work hard to think about what, what are the right ways to get cinematic footage of this and be safe. Um, and then I'll just mention, you know, because our cameras are rolling shutter and they're rolling shutter because it's, it's cheaper, better quality, 
um, just the, the, the scale that these cameras are produced for cell phones and, and innovation is happening. Um, and then a couple of fun, fun ones on the top right is just an example of, uh, I guess, an, an eagle um, coming in and grabbing our drone from, from the air and just kind of sending it. Uh, I think it actually chipped the propeller here as well. Um, so that's a, that's a moving object that uh, I'm not sure what we could really do since it's a lot more agile than our drone. Um, and then here in the, in the bottom right is a fun one. So this is actually part of uh, us filming a video a few years ago. Um, and this is two drones that are filming a wake border that crashed into each other. Um, and, and that's of course an, an interesting aspect is when you do have multiple drones, whether you control it or not, how do you, um, you know, how do you do that? Do you do relative localization visually? Do you, um, do you do it based on their kind of world frame positions? Do you detect it visually? Um, so a lot of interesting challenges there, but that, that's kind of what I think about dynamic objects. And the, uh, another fun one I just, I just pulled off from, I saw in a Facebook group, um, as far as a dynamic object goes. So you, you never know what you'll find, what people are doing. But uh, th this is actually not super crazy because we also, you know, people use our drones and drones in general for monitoring fires and smoke. And, and actually stereo vision can, you know, see smoke to extend and, and, and be good around it um, if, you, if you're not actually inside of it. So, okay. So in thinking about kind of open, open problems and, and goals, I, I think we've, you know, we're at the point where we really, it's, it's good enough to succeed in at a broad scale, but there's, there's a long, long way to go. Right. So I think that the classic kind of thrust is being smaller, lighter, cheaper, um, and, you know, full, full integration of the hardware with sensors and, and using better, cheaper sensors. Um, that's just, you know, I think this is a thrust that's, you know, uh, best done at, at the companies that are making drones and it, it requires a huge amount of investment and, and cost to, to make these things. If you think about kind of how many, you know, what's the annual budget of making an iPhone? It's, it's in, it's in the billions of dollars and the, you know, just the more you can do it at scale, the more effort you can put into every little detail, it'll, it'll optimize and every generation will be smaller and better and, and faster. And, and that's happening. Um, I think new vehicle morphologies are an interesting question. Like what we see a lot of research in this, that's, that's fascinating and, and useful and has potential. Um, there's a good question of when, when does this actually go into production? You know, when would we make a vehicle that can um, flap its wings and I think that's still pretty far out because of just a lot more gains to be had in the in the first section and the whole thing just being so complex that adding additional complexity um, is is just a kind of a daunting undertaking. Um, of course, uh, high speed agile flight. So complex aerodynamics. I mean, things we've seen are like transient torques in high speed maneuvers when you have wind gusts. Um, especially if you know you need to estimate your own air density and a bunch of model parameters and what happens if you kind of are in a flight regime that's kind of unobservable like maybe the person just took off and flew in a straight line and then you you really aren't able to decouple your calibrations from your IMU biases from the air density from your thrust coefficients um, and uh, so things like that and then and then when you get into these transient effects um, and then I think, you know, throwback to, to Lucas talk that this idea of kind of a 360 total scene understanding is, is super, super key for the future. So having a semantic and geometric understanding of what's around. Um, and a big thing that we're pushing for is you know, real time 3D reconstruction of anywhere we fly and, and you can do better versions offline as well, but things like, you know, if the drone has flown through hallway or around a building like we we should be able we have all the data to build accurate 3d maps um and kind of not just do vio but do the next level of, of real-time structure from motion and i'll talk about that in in a bit um and another kind of interesting one is you know 3d reconstruction and photogrammetry is something we've been focusing on and thinking about a lot as we build our our 3d scan product um but reconstruction of thin objects um at at high resolution 
is a big challenge and also reconstruction of moving objects. So, you know, basically every photogrammetry package out there right now, if you capture something that's even moving slightly, even though you have enormous amounts of data on it, the reconstruction will, will fail. Um, and it, like, let's say you take a, a, a bunch of pictures of a person that's trying to hold still, it, it will not work. It'll come out extremely garbled. And I think there's a ton of potential there. Um, and, and of course, human pose estimation, things like understanding of a person sitting, standing, and that's, you know, uh, you, you have very different motion models there, right? Even if they're in the same position and stationary, um, understanding where they're going to go. And kind of a good one that's a, that's a, a safety idea is just kind of uh, you know, knowing you're in a roadway without cars. Um, and that's still a dangerous place to be and saying, okay, we don't want to loiter there, or we want to warn the user. And, and that, those are the kind of things that will get drones kind of to be accepted more by the, the FAA, for example. Um, yeah, and then learning from unlabeled data, from real data, because as the more kind of you get better, the more the hard edge cases are hard to reproduce in simulation. And um, it's it, we've done a lot of work here, but there's a, there's a long way to go um, until we're kind of really at the level where it's it's truly you know just you, you don't think about crashing. Um, and and so another thing is just it's for us it's time you know the technology is good enough to really bring it in into the mainstream. You know these things are. Uh, jaw-dropping demos in a lot of cases, but they're just like, it's just beginning. I think for consumers, we put a lot of work into that and and there's still a long way to go, but for for commercial use cases, there's there's a huge amount to, to do and it's very, very early. Um, so we've kind of thought about what's the biggest thing we could possibly focus on and inspection and mapping just seems like the obvious case now. And there's just the entire kind of built world to be, to be inspected and monitored. And each of these areas can be kind of billion- dollars you know per year spent on on these things and and the traditional you know there are lots of ways of doing these things that are very dangerous and very expensive compared to a low-cost piece of hardware doing doing this task so it's just kind of obviously motivating but even then manual drones are very hard to fly easy to crash and it's it's not necessarily scalable um so if you look at this it, this is kind of an example bridge that somebody has flown with our product to capture the the perfect data set to make a, a 3D model. And this is about 2,600 photos over, um, a, I think a 12 battery flight. And so if you think about trying to capture this manually, it's, it's extremely, extremely difficult to keep this in your head, to fly this, to take all these photos. And it's, it's very time consuming. So it's, it's just super ripe for automation. Um, and I'll, I'll just show the first minute of this kind of uh, video since we just launched this product 3D scan. Um, this this week, and I think it'll it'll show some good examples. So the, 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 basic, the basic workflow here is that you, you tell the drone a 3D volume and then it will go explore it, build a real-time 3D model. And then you pick a few parameters that are high level, like what resolution you want. And then it will go in and capture all of the imagery that has the right overlap and is the right connected kind of pose graph. Um, and then you can end up putting those photos into a photogrammetry package and getting uh, super high quality 3D models like, like this one. Um, for a whole bunch of different use cases. And so the thing I just wanna call out here is that uh, a lot of the, there's a layer of algorithms on top of our kind of online VIO and obstacle avoidance here. And, you know, some of this incremental structure of motion that is parallel to our VIO can use information from that, but is 
drift free, can localize between flights, can leverage a lot of our online system. So we're not starting from scratch. It's, it's really running everything that we, we have and using a shared deep learning core. Um, so we control the capture, we create the pose graph that's well connected, and we, we, we do this stuff in flight. And then we refine it after flight as well. And then on the dynamic scan planning side, you know, we need to think about what's an efficient way to capture the data set. What are the metrics for coverage um, that, that can be said that we know this will create a good 3D model? Does it depend on the structure type? Well, of course it does. And, and how to adapt to changes in, in these structures. So this has been a, a huge focus of ours in the past year and kind of really like bringing this into the mainstream to make it easier to capture 3D models, leveraging the autonomy that drones can provide to, to accomplish this task. Um, so, yeah, and then, uh, you know, we, we, we've shipped this, we're super excited, and it's, it's one last kind of 3D model that, you know, this is, a, this is a semiconductor facility in Arizona, water cooling section of it. This is the drone exploring it to build the real-time map, and then you can see kind of some of the model here. Yeah, that's it. Uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us and hopefully there was some interesting